as the first test has been concluded so here i will discuss the questions which has been asked so now i hope that the question which has been asked in the test was of the standard which you are thinking okay so now discussing the very first question and before discussion i just want to tell you that here i am not talking about the content which is required in every question for that we already have model answer and here we are discussing about how we can address the question that is more important because you can read the material from anywhere okay so now i am starting so the very first question is the common need of metals and other resources during the ancient period produced a network of communication between different regions of the country and outside the country also now here first understand that the question is about the relation between metals and other resources with the network of communication so as you saw this question what should come in your mind that is what are the different kinds of metal which you are going to insert in your answer that gold silver copper iron tin these are the things which you will mention in your answer but the question is other resources also in other resources you can mention silks silk better lips because better lips we got to know about the better lips from indonesia and we know that the gupta period and the southern kingdom like chola have a contact with the southeast asian countries about the silk or about the cotton if i say then it is from china about the gold you know that it came from the greek during the kusan period about the iron i will say that it is because of the contact from north india and the south india so these are the things which should come in your answer the very first thing now after this in your mind i will say that better to mention your answer a along the lines of different kingdom or civilization you can write any points whatever you want but if you are writing your answer like harappan civilization that how the metals and the other resources during the harappan period have established the network of communication likewise mauryan likewise gupta likewise another southern kingdom like satwana chola chera pandya so basically you will have to divide your answers by making sub headings of the different empire or the different king so whenever you are talking about the harappa you can say rajasthan from rajasthan khetri mines the metals like copper were being imported that has established the communication then in afghanistan they have trading colony they have trading colony and through this trading colony they were making a contact with the central asian countries now whenever you are writing this you always the students always ask to me sir kuch alag kaise kare are jo hai pehle wo to kar lo alag to bata raha hu main alag to kar sakte hai for example whenever you are mentioning central asia then you can mention that india is focusing on chabahar port to have the close links with the central asian country and its footprint in the european economic union aaj se relate kar diya maine harappan civilization now likewise during the mauryan period you can talk about that the ashokan inscription found in the southern kingdom or along the east coast of india that is in andhra it establishes the link 
that there was a relation between the Dakshin and the Uttarpath. Uttarpath and Dakshinpath. Likewise, blankets were being imported from Nepal during the Mauryan period. If there would not have been the iron culture, then the kingdoms like Mauryan kingdom, Satavana kingdom or any consecutive kingdom would not have flourished. And that has established the relation between the northern and the southern regions of the country. Likewise, during Satavana kingdom, they have again the relation with the Roman Empire. They have well developed ports. Python, Nasik, these are the ports through which Satwana were doing the trade and it has established the communication. Likewise, Chola Chera Pandya, where what was the geographical location of Chola Chera Pandya? At the coastal area. So that is resulting into the import and export amongst these kingdoms. Along with this, they have a relation with the Roman Empire, especially the Egypt. So these are the things which you can mention here and now this is a 10 marker question. So this much content is more than enough. So now we will move to second question. So the second question is the age of Kusan and Satavana was the most flourishing period in the craft and commerce of India. I went through many papers which you have written and I found one thing that you people have knowledge about the craft of Satavana and the Kusan Priya. But none of the students have mentioned about the commerce of Kusan and Satavana in detail. Some of the students have done this but the presentation is poor. So yes, you can talk about the Kushan and Satwana like this. So whenever you are talking about the Kushan, so make a subheading Kushan and then talk about their craft and commerce. For example, during the Kushan period, there was a brick trade, brick trade from Tigris of Euphrates to Mediterranean Sea to the Oxus Sea. So basically these are the areas where the brick trade was happening. Along with this you can say about the import that during the Kushan kingdom gold, silver was imported and timber was exported, silk was exported. So this represents the commerce of the Kushan period. Then about the craft. About the craft, everybody is talking about the Gandhara art. That is fine. But there was an influence of bacterian kingdom also. And from this bacterian kingdom, Kusan brought the idea of terracotta. <coughs> the, they brought the idea of building material, hard building material. Obviously, after that, you can talk about Vasudeva. Vasudeva sculpture, you can talk about the glass making, art or craft of Kusan. So basically you will have to segregate your answer like Kusan and then Satavana. So after that you can mention here Satavana. For again the same thing we will do Satavana. And in this question I will say some of the students have made a map on or to represent the Satwana and the Kusan kingdom, that is a good way of representation. But I will advise that every student should do this. And how I can say this, because I have personally checked all the copy and therefore I can tell with the name that who has drawn the map and who has not drawn the map. Okay, the Satwana kingdom. So in the Satwana kingdom again, craft. So about the craft, everybody knows that you will talk about the Amravati. So just mentioning the Amravati will not give you a name. You should mention about the craft of paddy transplantation. Paddy transplantation. You should mention that they have a materialistic culture and therefore you will find 
that they were using floor tiles. Then you can talk about the drainage system. Then you can talk about the Amravati plus Nagarjuna Konda Kips. Nagarjuna Konda Kips. So these are the things you should mention. Now commerce. At the time of Satwana, we have seen the development of guilds. There were 18 different types of guilds. Then in the Periphalus of Erythran Sea, Periphalus of Erythran, this is a book. Periphalus of Erythran Sea. In this book, it was mentioned that they have three trading posts Tagar, Pathan, Nasik. Then again, you can talk about their relation with the North Indian Kingdom and all. So these are the things and this should be the way of representation in your answer. Understand? Now moving to the next question. How far it is correct to say that the administration of Maratha state under Sivazi was similar to of Deccan Sultan? So most of you have started talking about the Sivaji in the introduction. But if in the introduction, you are not giving me a reflection that you are maintaining a link between the great Sivazi and the Deccan Sultan. And if other aspirant is doing this, so obviously I will give more marks to him. Therefore, you can simply say that whatever Sivaji has learned about the administration, that is from Malik Ambar of Ahmad Nagar and from the Bijapur kingdom. Ahmad Nagar and Bijapur kingdom. So Marathas were basically soldiers. Marathas were basically soldiers. And Sivaji father was himself involved in the Deccan Sultan kingdom. Therefore, when the Sivaji was growing, then he has seen how the administration is being run in this Deccan Sultan. So this should be your introduction. After that, you can divide your answer or should divide your answer that what he has learned from Deccan Sultan in terms of central administration, in terms of revenue administration and in terms of military administration. You should divide your answer like this. And then you should say that in the terms of central administration, Ast Pradhan, everybody has written this, Ast Pradhan. But you should talk about the centralized authority of the Maratha kingdom was brought from Deccan Sultan. Then you can talk about that the two persons that is the Nyadhis and Pandit Rao were not participating in the war. Then about the revenue administration, Chauth and Sardes Mukhi, everybody has written this. But you should talk about Kathi system of measurement from the Deccan Sultan. Mirsardars, how the Tiwazi was keeping a control over Mirsardars. Then about military administration, you should talk about Saranjami system. You should talk about Pindaris, basically they were the people who were while or basically you can say that they were plundering the Mughal empire and that are the bands which is going along with the Marathas military and Marathas military was known for the cavalry, was known for the persons who were on the horses, they were known for the navy also. So each and everything was inspired by Deccan Sultan. Some of the students have not addressed this question thinking of that, okay, I don't know about the Deccan Sultan, then how I can write about the Maratha? You are not required to know anything about the Deccan Sultan except this fact of Ahmadnagar and Bijapur. After that, whatever you know about the Maratha, you should write that. It is because the question which I have framed simply gives me a reflection that it was inspired. 
if i say that whether it was inspired by the kingdom of deccan sultan or not then you can say yes or no but here it is established fact as the question is reflecting that yes maratha administration was best on the deccan sultan so it's very simple to write now we will see the next question that is indian nation movement developed a complex and sophisticated critic of the basic feature of india's colonial economy so you can start your introduction what britisher was thinking of india so britisher was thinking that this is a white man burden <clears throat> and this idea of white man burden has been exposed by dada bai nehru ji rc dak mahadev govind ranade gopal krishna gokhale and even before i will say bhaskar from maharashtra and raja ram mohan roy has also talked about the economic exploitation by the british so this can be your introduction after that everybody knows that you will talk about the drain theory drain theory means that the drain is going out from india without any economic advantages for india and it composed of home charges component <clears throat> home charges means salaries of the officers were paid from india interest payments whatever the loan company has taken for that the interest payment was being done by or tax of payment was being done from the from the colonial state like india then you can talk about then you can also talk about foreign fdi or you can say what was happening at that time that the land revenue was increased so when land revenue was increased to 50 to 60% high it was resulting into the peasant disposition of the land they were living their land their revenue from the land was decreasing and it was sometimes resulting into famine famine then you can talk about the railway so we always think that the railway has been developed by britisher for our benefits but not it was for their benefit for transporting the raw material from the hinterland hinterland of india so these are the points which you can write after that you should also write in brief that the impact of the economic critic impact has been that that this has set the tone for the swaraj for the demand of swaraj you can also say that even the britisher agreed after this criticism they agreed to give 1 million pound of rupee to the military from their side military expenditure from their side so this has been the impact of the critic of the colonial economy this if you are putting these two points in the conclusion or just before the conclusion it will make a difference clear so this is the way in which you can address this question now the next question is question number 5 it is from the world history that is explorer traders and missionaries played their respective role in the conquest of africa so we all know that africa geographical location is at the mediterranean sea or near germany you can say so basically because of its geographical location the colonial countries or you can say the powerful countries from europe like spain belgium france italy and uk everybody tries to make africa as their colony because at that time industrial revolution has started in uk and we know that the germany is the second leader of the industrial revolution 
therefore they need the raw material they need the market they need the people who can work for them so basically these are the reasons that the explorer traders and missionary have been the part of the program of the idea of colonialism for the conquest of africa and therefore in this question after understanding this you can talk about the explorer that the explorer started their journey towards africa because of their quest for scientific exploration or also because they have been paid by the businessman they have been paid by businessman to find out the new markets for their products so we are if you are writing the idea of explorer along with some name like samuel barker in this way you can divide your answer in a tabular form that explorer what is their idea and how they played a role then likewise trader so first trader came in the search of the raw material especially metal like copper from congo ivory there were many metals and the non metal resources available in the Af africa and therefore the conquest of africa is started by the trader then the last one is missionaries missionaries we know that in the european country the church have a powerful hold and there was always a competition between the capitalist class and the church so missionaries have also started their mission of propagating the ideas of christianity one because they want to spread the idea of christianity and another because they are in the competition with the traders and the explorer that we are at the top and we are also playing our role in the uh, in the strength of our country so they have started their mission of converting the people to the christianity at that time islam was also on their on its high so there was a competition to christianity from islam also and therefore they have started their mission and these are the reasons which you can mention in your answer clear now after this the next question is about the india since independence if jp movement was flawed in many respects the position imposition of emergency was also not infallible so basically this question is asking about simply the flaws of jp and the flaws of gandhi and flaws of indira gandhi very simple so basically this should be your understanding just after looking the question that what is the demand of the question so jp is what was his flaws the very first thing about the jp undoubtedly he was a great leader i am not questioning about his leadership about his intellectual capabilities about his idea of the total revolution i am not questioning that because the question is just asking about the flaw in the jp movement rather than the flaw in jp itself but if we are talking about the jp movement then yes it is a mix of his identity his understanding along with his actions therefore the first thing i can say about the jp that he believe in party led democracy he didn't believe in parliamentary democracy and therefore whatever he was thinking of his idea was utopian in nature the very first flow that his ideas of total revolution was utopian he was thinking to bring a revolution in ideological spiritual educational political social economic sphere which is really a utopian then you can talk about his incitement to police and army against the government this is a kind of sedition that you are trying to overthrow the government another thing you can say whatever the reason was the government in bihar gujarat and indira gandhi government was democratically elected government 
so if the government is democratically elected then you should take the democratic means to raise the protest against the government rather than asking about the unconstitutional means to overthrow the government after this flaws of the emergency flaws of the emergency it is very very easy to write but you can talk about justice sah committee so justice sah committee had highlighted that it was not infallible and then talk about the civil liberty you can talk about adm jabalpur case also here that article 21 was suppressed then you can talk about indira gandhi had imposed emergency on her own will on her own will rather than asking the cabinet then you can talk about freedom of press freedom of press was throttled then you can talk about forced sterilization so these are the things you take and highlight here and in this way after mentioning three or four points here three or four points here you are addressing both the parts of the question clear now after this just moving to the next question about the judicial footprints here i find that some of the students have not understood the demand of the question and they have started talking about the colonial hangover in present judiciary and tried to establish the link like increase in litigation and the representation and all so this is not required you will get zero marks for this now the question is the judicial footprint of the british era in india remain ambiguous so in this question i will say if it is asking about british era you cannot skip the mentioning of warren hastings cornwallis at least these two and if you can remember then william bentick also you can mention then you can mention in a very brief about the sarkar fauzdari adalat nizamat adalat circuit courts abolition of circuit court so basically you are giving the timeline of the judicial footprints in british era so if you are mentioning this you are fulfilling the demand of this part of the question remain ambiguous remain ambiguous then you can talk about the issues with the judiciary of that time the very first thing that the european judges were not aware about the indian customs and tradition then you can talk about that the european judges can only start the trial of european person in criminal cases so basically this is a kind of discrimination or racism in the judiciary then you can talk about that it was too complex that the civil case will be looked about in this part criminal cases by this part muslim personal law by this part of the court so this was very complex and very expensive also so at that time also only rich can go to the judiciary like today then you can talk about that there was a high chance of false evidence because the police was in the hand of british raj these are the points you will have to write after that briefly you can talk about the judicial footprints of british era in relation to the present india so this is in this way you should address this question do you agree after this mention the another point also if you want to fetch more marks you can say despite the ambiguity what good judicial system of british era brought was codification of the law codification of the law rule of law executive was responsible to the court executive was brought before the court to answer was brought before the court to ensure the accountability so these are the things which shows that it was not ambiguous 
So these are the things which is required to write in your answer. Now after this, I am just moving to the next question. Gandhi Irwin Pak was seen as a strategic break, had its own share of controversy. So again, there are two parts of the question. So in introduction, as I told you that, and you can watch the introductory class of mine on art and culture. In history, you should always try to start your introduction from the timeline. If you feel problem, or if you face any problem in introducing the question. So Gandhi, Irwin Pak, you can start the historic day of 1931, which has ended the civil disobedience movement and Congress agreed to participate in the round table conference. So this can be your introduction. And then how it was a strategic break? It was a strategic break because, and here you will have to highlight the positives of the Gandhi Irwin Pact. You can talk about the repeal of the salt tax. You can talk about it is because of this 1937 provincial election happened. It is because of this 1935 Government of India Act was brought in. It is because of this Congress, status of the Congress equal to the British Viceroy. So these are the things which you can mention but had its own share of controversy. It is because it is being alleged on Gandhiji that if he would have wanted, then the sentencing of the great Bhagat Singh would have been set. Then you can also say that the people were also not happy because agrarian reforms which were or you can say agrarian reforms related to the land has not been agreed by Irwin. Then you can also say that the Irwin was not agreed to free the political prisoners. To free the political prisoners. And he was considering the person who was involved in civil disobedience movement as criminals. So basically, this is the thing which you can mention here. Clear? Now, after this, the next question is about how did the civil uprising of the first half of 18th century establishes the link of 18th century how did the civil uprising of the first half of 18th century establish a strong and valuable local tradition of resistance against British rule. So some of the students asked me, sir, it should be 19th century rather than 18th century. Mere bhai, the question is not on 18th century and 19th century. It doesn't matter. Question is on civil uprising and its relation with the resistance against the British rule. Agar main 19th century likh deta, so then it will be easy for you to mention Munda, Santhal, Kond, Ram, Ram uprising. Tum bhar de de pure answer ko usse, uprising se. Question wo hai nahi. Question is about the relation between the civil uprising and the resistance against British. But even in this question, you should draw a map of civil uprising showing Paharia revolt, showing Sanyasi. Ramosi and then you will samjho ki kaise answer likhna hai. Then you will have to highlight their methods. Then you will have to highlight their concern, areas of concern. And then you will have to establish relation. How it established a path for the next civil uprising and how it has inspired the civil uprising like Munda and all and that at the same time how it has brought a resistance against the British. So, you have to understand how link is established. Then you can talk about the, the violence means 
that has you can say that has set a tone for the Munda revolt, Santhal revolt. Then you can talk about that every time they were using a religious symbol or the religious point in their sense of unity. And that has been also setting a tone for the resistance against British. Army. Because these civil uprisings have given us a reflection that the unity is very important in protest against the British. Army. Then you can also talk about their areas of concern that is rising tax. So you will see that even in the CDM, no rent campaign has been started in Gujarat, no Chaukidari campaign has been started in Bihar. So from here you can link the CDM, here you can link the NCM, here you can link Cute India movement and this was the demand of the question that the civil uprising and their methods, their ideology, their way of, their techniques, each and everything, how it has resulted into the resistance against the British. So, I have told you how to link establish the link. The content is already in the modern answer. If you repeat one repeat one it will, it is a wastage of your time. What is my answer? I will tell you, but it is not a You already have modern answer. Now, next question is on Tashkent Declaration. Again, Tashkent Declaration, you can talk about Sastriji and Ayub Khan. And then you can simply in the introduction give the background. That is, it is in the background of Operation Gibraltar of Pakistan attack through Gujarat. After that, After this war of 1962, USSR started a negotiation between India and Pakistan. So, this is the part of Tashkent Declaration. How the Tashkent Declaration makes a pivotal point? So, basically you can simply say, it is because of the Tashkent Declaration, both the parties came to the earlier position. It means that areas have been occupied from both India and Pakistan. And they came before the, to the earlier position, they will have to leave the places which has been annexed. And the problem is that the most strategic part which we had is Haji Peer Pass. And that also India will have to accede to the Pakistan because of the Tashkent Declaration. Then they both have agreed that they will not participate in the internal affairs of the country and they will follow the Vienna Convention 1861. So, after mentioning this, you can simply say it is after all this, the Tashkent Declaration is a complete failure because even after that, we have seen Kargil, Uri, Pathan Court, 1971 war and at that time, India was at the advantageous position and India should declare or India should compel the Pakistan to write an agreement in such a way that Pakistan will always be subservient to India. So, these are the things which you can mention in the conclusion. Now, the next question is about the Persian and the Greek invasion. So, the Persian and the Greek invasion had a great impact on culture and politics of ancient Greece. Here again I will say that you should draw the map and should highlight the Alexander coming from the western part of the country. You should highlight that how the Alexander has entered and fought battle of Hyperdus. Uh, battle of Hyperdus with Porus, the king Porus. And then you should also highlight the Greek invasion. In the map itself, you can highlight this. And then you can talk about the political impact of political impact and cultural impact of the Persian and the Greek separately. You can say that it is the, the defeat 
or the conquest of Alexander reflects the loopholes in the administration of India. It is because of the invasion that now we have the satrapi system. That the, at that time we have satrap system. So how this satrap system in the political setup came? It is because of the invasion. Then on the culture you can talk about Tharosti script. You can talk about the Asokan inscription and its influence on the pillars. Greek or Achaemenian influence on the pillar of the Asoka. So in this way you can handle the Persian and the Greek invasion and its impacts on the politics and the culture. Greece it is very simple to write again in the terms of politics and in the terms of culture. You can talk about its impact on architecture. You can talk about its impacts on terracotta. You can talk about its impact on the rituals that is being followed and that has been highlighted by Megasthenes. These are the things which you can mention in Persian and the Greek invasion. So here in the model answer, the points are clearly mentioned. You should remember that point. Here I just want to tell you that what should be your representation. Drawing the map is important. Then write Persian and under the Persian you should do like this. Political impact and the culture, cultural impact. The same will be with the Greek. Clear? Now, The next question is on the Chipko movement. The Chipko movement with its Gandhian methods remains exemplary for environmentalism in today. So what I saw in your answer that you are talking about the Chipko movements and Bahuguna and all, but you are not focusing too much on environmentalism in India today. So in this way, you are missing the second half of the question. So yes, you can start about the origin of the Chipko movement, then you can mention the timeline and all. After that, we should focus on Gandhian method. How it was Gandhian method? It was based on idea of non-violence and that is being represented in hugging the tree. In hugging the tree. Force has not been met with the force. Then you can talk about Gandhian idea of decentralization. It is because of the decentralized approach, it has spread to the southern part of the country also. Then you can talk about Gandhi is always focused on equality of representation. And therefore, we have seen more and more women have participated more and more women have participated. Then you can talk about Gandhian idea of trusteeship and then how this Chipko movement has established the fact that the nature is a kind of trust. We are the trustee of the nature. God has given us nature to protect it rather than to destroy it. So these are the things which you can mention in Gandhian myth. How it is exemplary today. That is very important. Exemplary kaise hai? So then you can mention exemplary for environmentalism in today. It is because that today the debate is going on between environment and economy. And from here the idea of sustainable development came. An idea of sustainable development based on Gandhian idea. That nine more earth would be less for the people to survive if they will go for the destruction and deforestation of the forest. Then also you can talk about rise of ecofeminism. That is Sunita Narayan, Vandana Siva, ecofeminism. Then you can talk about Narmada Bachao Andolan, Medha Patekar. Then you can talk about Seb Bukswa, Seb Bukswa protest based on Gandhian idea. Then also 
you can talk about or you can give the example of niyamgiri hills that how the gandhian idea of using the gram sabha that is a decentralized approach has helped them to oust the fosco plant to set up their steel plant there and destructing the environment so these are the things how it is exemplary for environmentalism in india clear now after this you have handled both the part of the push so now we are moving to the next question now this question is about the industrial revolution in co that the industry did not stop in the continent instead there was distribution to other places which paved the way for colonization now this question has three parts did not stop in the continent and therefore you will see that industrial revolution is not only about the industries on the land it has established its link and setting the commercial relation with the another parts of the country through water through air and all now the second part is distribution to other places so it is not about that the industrial revolution which has started in uk was limiting in uk only so the it was distributed to the other places then relation between the industrial revolution and colonization these are the three things which you are required to do in your answer now you can say distribution to other places so it distributed to usa the same advantages that uk had in 1600 the same advantages usa had after 100 and 150 years the discovery of a steam engine power loom these are the thing, discovery of iron these are the reasons that the uk has developed industrial revolution the same was with the us then you can talk about germany germany was called a second leader of industrial revolution then you can talk about russia industrial revolution has spread to russia owing to its natural capabilities or natural resources that russia has then japan after meiji restoration after meiji restoration we have seen industrial revolution in japan also. and after mentioning this you should maintain the link between industrial revolution and colonization so industrial revolution simply means more and more products more and more products means more and more markets required first point more and more products requires more and more raw material for more and more raw material requires a new source of the raw material then you can talk about industrial revolution gives them gave them wealth and that has resulted into the military might so it was easy for them to go for war and the first world war second world war everywhere you will see that this military might was the reason and the force behind the military might was industrial revolution again you can if you want to write more points you can talk about conquest of asia was because of a spice trade conquest of africa we have just seen so these are conquest of southeast asia you can mention then you can mention the other reasons and establishing the link between industrial revolution and the colonization now next question is about the colonization of asia and africa both happened in different phase and for different purpose and decolonization was a mix of peaceful and violent struggle in these contexts so now here the colonization of asia and africa here what you can do you can make a two table colonization of asia and africa happened in different phase so we all know that the africa colonization of africa started in the first half of the 18th century but the colonization of the asia started little late i will say 
तो यू हैव मेंशन दिस फेज फेजेस फॉर द कोलोनाइजेशन ऑफ एशिया एंड फेजेस फॉर द कोलोनाइजेशन ऑफ अफ्रीका एंड देन यू कैन राइट डिफरेंट पर्पस तो एशिया ऑब्वियसली बोथ वेर कॉलोनाइज बिकॉज ऑफ द रॉ मेटेरियल एंड द मार्केट but majorly africa was colonized because of its tribal culture and the need of slave for the plantation and for the industries and africa were, or asia was colonized because of the spice market and because of the market not for the slave so this was about the first part different purposes different phase now the second part decolonization then the best example you can give of india it was a mix of peaceful and violent struggle mahatma gandhi moderate phase peaceful extremist phase violence quit india movement is called most un gandhian of all the gandhi movement so it was direct action day then it was a mix of peaceful and the violent then you can talk about morocco peaceful algeria violent vietnam violent so in this way you can mention that how it is a mix of violent and the peaceful system so this is the way through which you will have to answer this particular question now the next question is on indian partition indian partition do an attempt of congress to have the graceful solution to the demands of muslim league was bloody and the heart wrenching process so basically again there are two parts of the question first you will have to highlight how it was an attempt of the graceful solution so here you can mention about the lucknow pact where the separate electorate has been agreed by the congress though it was a kind of blunder but yes they have at least agreed for a graceful solution then you can talk about crips mission then you can talk about gandhi jinna talk where gandhi agreed that the muslim living in baluchistan sindh and bengal can have their own state crips mission also represented or also recognized the muslim majority in some provinces and then cabinet mission plan also grouping of all the muslim or majority provinces so this was an attempt for the graceful solution but it was turning into the bloody and the heart wrenching process what was the reason for this the reason was unplanned or you can say early withdrawal of british mount betton does not have any plan or you can say he has made an early withdrawal and when mount betton was thinking of the common governor general jinnah was finding his position and because of his cost to be in power it has become turning into the bloody and heart wrenching form then you can talk about religious fanatics we all know the rise of communalism in the entire indian national movement has resulted into the heart wrenching process then you can talk about red cliff line whatever has been promised with respect to the geographical divide between india and pakistan has not been done that has also resulted into the bloody process of partition so these are the things which you will have to mention in this question addressing both the parts of the question now the next question is historic dandi march marked the launch of civil disobedience movement okay so to address this question you will have to just mention the date of dandi march and its objective in a one line that's all in this context explain the spread of civil disobedience movement in the terms of population popular response and regional pattern So in the terms of popular response you can say the participation of lawyers the participation of women both married and unmarried the participation of youth the participation of khudai khadmatkar or you can say red shirts red shirts 
this is called a popular response you can also talk about sri raja gopalchari k kalapan this is a popular response regional pattern here you can talk about up bihar assam gujarat nagaland northeastern part in assam we know that the student have started the kaningam circular in bihar no chokidari movement started in up no rent campaign started in gujarat also no rent campaign was started in northeast rani gadgalu has started the protest after the civil disobedience movement against the british army so in this way you have added the first part also and the second part also of this question okay now the next part of this question is congress ministers post 1937 election with toothless tiger how far do you agree so it simply means that you will have to talk about the 1937 elections briefly in introduction you can say that after the gandhi irwin pact that sets the tone for 1937 election congress won in 11 of 17 provinces they were toothless tiger because the fund crunch they do not have any financial power they were toothless tiger because the war clouds started mongering for the second world war in that condition there was very less for them to do then also you can mention about the fund crunch war clouds and then also you can talk about the zamindar as an obstacle therefore they failed to bring the agrarian reform these are they are therefore they were called as toothless tiger then you can say about the reactionary second chamber where the muslim league and all zamindar landlords were against this congress ministry but they were not toothless in the sense that the civil liberties have been upheld by them they were not toothless because emergency were revoked by them so in this way you will have to highlight both the parts of the question first they were toothless tiger and second they were not toothless tiger so here you will write you will read the model answer so the idea of discussion just to tell you that how to address the question what will be the content it is already in the model answer okay now the next question is about the basic feature of the colonial structure so the basic feature of the colonial structure you can mention the basic feature in administration or you can say political setup parliamentary democracy colonial structure governance colonial structure in the terms of legal ipc crpc then you can talk about education colonial structure in education at that time filtration theory of macule so these were the features of the colonial structure how much of this structure is evident even today so yes structure is evident even today in ipc archaic laws like sedition it is evident even today because english is a medium of communication it is even today because the judges are being honored with the word lordship which is colonial mindset it is colonial because ics indian civil service does not have sensitivity for the people second arc have highlighted that they want to use absolute power so absolute power was being used by the british so it is evident today but at the same time you will have to highlight along with this there have been many reforms which has been brought for example you can talk about separation of judiciary from executive you can talk about committee has been set up subramanyam committee to repeal the archaic laws section 377 have been considered unconstitutional national education policy in education 
टॉक्स अबाउट द एजुकेशन इन द मदर टंग तो दिस इज एविडेंट बट एट द सेम टाइम रिफॉर्म हैज बिन ब्रॉन क्लियर नाउ द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन पीपल ऑफ इंडिया डिमांडेड फॉर ए रिस्पॉन्सिबल गवर्नमेंट बट वॉट वॉज इंट्रोड्यूस्ड बाई इंडियन काउंसिल एक्ट वॉज बेनोवेलेंट डेस्पोटिज्म वॉट आई सॉ इन दिस क्वेश्चन यू पीपल आर टॉकिंग अबाउट इंडियन काउंसिल एक्ट नाइनटीन नाइनटीन जीरो इन डिटेल सो आई विल से दैट इज दिस इज वन पार्ट ऑफ योर आंसर इन दिस क्वेश्चन यू विल हैव टू मैंशन थ्री पार्ट फर्स्ट इज डिमांड ऑफ द पीपल ऑफ इंडिया then what was in the indian council act and then why it was called that it provided benevolent despotism this is a three different part so demand of the people so in the demand of the people you can say that indians were not presented in civil services though their demand was the representation of indians in civil service and legislative council then Gopal Krishna Gokhale met to Lord Minto and talked about the Swaraj demand of Swaraj. So this was the demand of the people. Then you can mention the different provisions of Indian Council Act 1909 and why it is called as benevolent despotism because what they got is constitutional monarchy, not a parliamentary democracy. then you can mention then you can mention power of governor general was intact veto power was with him then budget was discussed budget can be discussed but budget cannot be amended then separate electorate so these are the things that highlight that what we got from the indian council act 1909 was benevolent despotism so these have three parts and you are writing first and second part only leaving the first part okay so now moving to the next question shock therapy was really a shock for the countries which adopted it so most of the students have not addressed this question so i just want to mention that the shock therapy was started through washington consensus by imf बस एक ये वर्ड अगर तुम्हें पता है तो यू कैन इजिली एड्रेस दिस क्वेश्चन तो आफ्टर द फॉल ऑफ यूएसएसआर आई एम एफ स्टार्टेड सॉक थेरेपी थ्रू वॉशिंगटन कंसेंस एंड इन दिस वॉशिंगटन कंसेंस आई एम एफ वॉज फोकसिंग अपॉन फ्री ट्रेड रेजिंग तो दिस वॉशिंगटन के कंसेंस वॉज टेलिंग दैट ऑल द ट्रेड एग्रीमेंट एमंग्स द सोशलिस्ट कंट्रीज will be of no use today now the new trade agreement will be signed then pre floating currency system will be used then fdi fdi foreign direct investment will start in socialist country so this was a shock therapy so this has been adopted by the country but what we saw that it is because of the shock therapy you can write the asian financial crisis and all in the russia we have seen that the entire banking establishments were shut down more than 1500 banks were of no use in russia then industries have been collapsed then we have seen the rise of oligarchy in this socialist country then we have seen food crisis because this shock therapy has stopped the collectivization of the land that has resulted into the food crisis in these countries so these are the things which you will have to write but lastly you can say that the coming reforms in the mode of capitalism in the last decade has been proved more beneficial even for the socialist country like china which is having the market led capitalism in the economic setup of its country 
so it is not about that the shock therapy has always been a shock it depends upon the technical capabilities political will understanding and the linkages with the global supply chain so that to maximize the benefit by using this capitalist model of economic growth which has been envisaged to the shock therapy so these are the things which you will have to write in such answer so that's all about the discussion on test 1 of advanced test series consisting eight sectional and four full length model answers will be uploaded along with this video discussion and uh, question paper will also be uploaded separately on this particular discussion so this discussion is only about the way in which you should frame the answers rather than about the content content is already in the model thanks to all of you